Hello, everybody. My name is Katie with Greenland Quilter, and I have a new interviewee for today. Her name is Brandy with Quilts on Fire, and we're going to have a good time today. So, uh, Brandy, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, Katie. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. It's exciting to be with the Greenland Quilter. Um, a little bit about myself. Well, my business is the Quilter on Fire. I'm a firefighter turned quilter. Well, actually, I've been doing both all the way along. And um, yeah, I'm an art quilter primarily. But in the last few years, I've dabbled in modern quilting, which I truly love. I'm having so much fun with it. I'm a teacher, speaker, author, and judge in the quilting world. And the thing I think I'm probably a little more known for is the Quilter on Fire podcast. And recently, I just started up the Quilter on Fire YouTube channel as well. So that's kind of my business and story in a nutshell. That's what I'm all about. Outstanding. So who influenced you to learn how to sew? Well, I have a few early, early beginning moments when I remember stitching for the first time. I know that I dabbled in Barbie clothes and I know that I used to go across the back lane when I lived with my mom when I was really young to a flea market. And it was kind of more a crafty sale type of flea market. And there was this one lady who had a table full, piled full of Cabbage Patch Kid clothing that oh, she God. made. and that was at the time in my life when I had a Cabbage Patch Kid and I would just walk by her table back and forth. And finally she said, sit down, I'm going to teach you how to sew. Cause I went every Sunday to that market and she sat me down and taught me how to make an outfit. It was actually a shirt or, and it had buttons and they were all crooked. And I, you know, I didn't do the best job, but I made something. <laughs> and um, those were my first earliest stitches that I remember. And um, at the end of that market season, she I remember she gave me this fun fur bunting for that Cabbage Patch Kid. And I couldn't even like if you if you know where I lived at the time in Manitoba, Canada, it's like the frozen tundra in the wintertime. Um, having this bunting for your Cabbage Patch Kid was a real luxury. You know, you'd have a few outfits and that's it. You wouldn't get to have this extra special piece of clothing. It was the most expensive thing on her table. And uh, she gave that to me. So she really kind of launched a creativity in me that early on. I was probably about 12 and uh, I never looked back. I was just crazy about crafts ever since. Wow. Um, how, let's see here. When did you begin to piece quilt? How old were you when you finished your very first quilt? My very first quilt, I was about 21 years old. And I had been this crazy, voracious crafter for years already, but I'd never actually stitched anything on a sewing machine before. And I worked in a craft store, a great big giant one, and I was actually the sample maker. And I just, I couldn't even believe someone would hire me to do that job. I got to go in the lunchroom and just have fun playing my entire shift. But a friend of mine asked me, you know, you're pretty crafty. Do you think you could make a quilt for my great grandmother? She's turning 80. And I was like, of course, sure. Like not having any idea what it meant to make a quilt or how difficult it would be. I embarked on this project and her, her requirements right off the bat were it needs to have photos in it. It needs to have floral fabrics. It needs to have lace. And <laughs> I was like, sure, no problem. I did have access after all at the craft store to this huge fabric store. Um, so I bought all the stuff and I started making it. I had no idea how difficult it would be. I scrambled to get it together at the last minute and I delivered it in person to her at the party. And when I saw the look on her great grandmother's face, I was absolutely hooked. I just couldn't even believe she ran and wanted it put on the wall immediately. And uh, it was just such a heartwarming experience in my life that I just dove into quilting from there on in. And I've loved it ever since. Wow. So do you have any idea how long you've been sewing and quilting? Yeah, well, if that was 21 ish, not to tell you my age or anything, but it's been over 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so you have quite a good understanding of how everything works. Yeah. So what are your favorite styles of fabric? 
Well, I actually do love to make my own fabric. I love painting, dyeing, surface design and that type of thing. So mm. that's what I do the most. Um, but when it comes to fabrics designed by creators, oh, I just love the ones that are kind of painterly and uh, deep, rich florals, deep, rich colors. I love the ones that are kind of artful. I kind of have an artful quilting background. So I gravitate to the ones that are just beautiful, fluid colors and things like that. So does that mean you like batiks too? Yes, I love batiks. I don't necessarily go for the designs that are like animals or, you know, those kind of things. I go for the sort of natural, organic looking shapes and designs. But I have a stash of batiks that is, uh, I don't know, gargantuan. <laughs> I love batiks. Yeah, I, I'm all about color of batiks. I'm not so much about, you know, the designs. But if this is any indication, they'll tell you how much I like color. Yeah, so, it's beautiful. Yeah. Batiks always has it, so it's fun. Yeah. Um, who is your favorite fabric and pattern designer and why? Oh, gosh. I have interviewed so many. That is kind of like picking your favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you give us an idea of a, a couple, maybe? Yeah. Well, I guess some of the f the really fun ones I've interviewed are Kay Facet. I mean, he's, he's an explosion of color. The quote on the podcast when I interviewed him was, there's enough beige in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there's so many. Anna Maria Horner kind of was one of the early ones I interviewed that spawned me onto just starting to interview all kinds of wonderful designers. There's so many that I just love. Um, but yeah, you know what I think I love the most about the design world is that there's always a new design around the corner. Yeah. When I go to quilt shows and I see new designers coming up, I just think, oh, you know, they're so creative and there's just endless possibilities. They see things in the world and they translate that into fabric and it just amazes me. It's like there's a young woman that lives in the Netherlands. Her name is Irani of Sugary Dew and mm. she has done her first um, fabric line through Bernatech. And oh. it's called Robo Boogie. Oh. And what she did, she used to be, before she became a uh, this quilting powerhouse, because that's what I think of her, um, she used to be a robot technician. So oh. she took her knowledge of robot and made fabric. And it's pretty neat. Oh, that sounds fun. I, I do actually have her on my podcast guest dream list. So I'll have to connect with her get her on the yeah, show I'm, I'm going to be interviewing her and i'm so excited oh, because good. I, I participated in the bernina um uh sugary dew quilt along back in 2020 and the uh, quilt that we made was pretty challenging i learned a lot of new skills i didn't have and um she just she's very artistic okay so what is your quilting style traditional modern or both well, I would definitely say I'm an art quilter through and through. I make abstract everything. I really dive into the fabric and I create from there. Um, but recently over the last few years, I've I've started doing some modern quilts and I've had a lot of fun with that. I've entered QuiltCon a couple of times and I've got one in, which was so exciting. And it actually mm -hmm. sold at the show. So that was a really joyful experience. And um, so this will be my third year in a row entering quilts in QuiltCon. So I've dabbled in modern as well. I just love the aesthetic. And, um, you know, I've made a lot of traditional quilts as well over the years, but those are mostly if I'm creating a pattern or if I'm going to go on a cruise, if I'm going to go on a cruise to teach or something like that. So I have a few patterns as well. But yeah, I think art quilting really is my jam. I think that's cool. Uh, what is your future quilt project that you really want to pour yourself into? Well, I recently got a um, a quilt top from a curator and collector, and it's massive. It's like a king size quilt. It's it's over 110 inches square, and um, so my task is to take that vintage 1930s quilt top that an unknown creator made and repurpose it into a new quilt for today. So that's my latest challenge and I'm really having a lot of fun with it. I haven't done anything to it yet. I keep carrying it around, putting it on my wall, laying it over the rail and I keep looking at it. And 
I think if I'm brave enough, I think I'm going to cut it into a hundred pieces and put it back together in a different way and then put some powerful words on it. So I think that that's probably oh, coming up in I'd my future. I'd love to see the finishing of it when you get it done. Yeah. What other hobbies do you dabble in? Well, I absolutely love to read, or I should actually reframe that and say, I love to listen. So I'm absolutely addicted to Audible. So listening to books, probably five or six a month and just love that. And then hiking is my thing. Like we have a puppy who's two and we just love to take her out into the wilderness and go. And my husband and I travel so much. He travels one week a month and I travel usually about two weeks a month. If we ever get time together, we're out in the wilderness for sure. Yep. Nature is the best place to be. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about your journey into making quilts and how you envisioned it in the beginning and how did you progress into becoming a quilt judge? Sure. So in the beginning, I didn't realize it, but I was using quilting as a way to de-stress over the last few decades, I've kind of realized that I had a really tough job as a firefighter and that's what I was doing. I was quilting to kind of, you know, get escape from that world. And over time, it gradually just really became a creative outlet. I was dreaming about how I could start a business with it. And um, then I got into podcasting and the podcasting is really what helped me blossom as a quilter. Um, I learned so much and I surrounded myself with this amazing community of creatives who've really lifted me up. And instead of sort of feeling outside the quilting world because I was an art quilter, I was starting to be let in with open arms. And my goal in the podcast was cr to create that community and to share people's stories. And that really has been what's helped me flourish. And then most recently, over the last 10 years actually, has been my journey to become a quilt judge. I really was on an educational path. I really wanted to get better as a quilter. Uh, my goal as a judge is not to judge anyone. And actually, I, I kind of wish that it wasn't called judging. I wish it was called, you know, educational assessments or something like that. Yeah. But as a judge, I really was just trying to train myself and learn to be a better quilter myself. And so as an art quilter, I hadn't really done all the traditional patterns and um, I actually never followed patterns. I just created my own thing. And so learning to be a quilt judge, if I didn't know what a cathedral window was, I had to sit down and make one. And, you know, yeah. there are all kinds of processes I didn't know how to do. And if I didn't know anything about garment making, I had to study it and I had to really work hard to make my first garment or two. So I would make boxer shorts or retrofit a pair of jeans or recently I just made my first dress. So you need to understand those kinds of construction in order to be a judge because a lot of times there's quilted garments in shows. So really the path to become a judge was, it was all about three things actually. The first part was taking the mentors that were around me and learning from them and then diving in and doing the work and learning as much as I can, take as much courses as I can. And then in the end, now that I am a judge, I feel like I can come full circle and help educate other people. That's outstanding. How does binding a quilt, or how does binding on a quilt affect how you judge a quilt? This is such a great question, Katie, because a lot of times you hear out there, oh, the judge is always so picky about the binding. Well, the binding is such an integral part of the quilt. If you think about it, it's the finishing and it's the first thing that gets worn out. And, you know, over 20, 30, 40, 100 years, this quilt will still be here when we're gone. And if the binding is not really good quality, that's the first thing that will disintegrate, right? So when it comes to binding, I think it's really important to have a binding that just fits properly. It's uniform and even. We want a binding that's not empty of batting. And we want a binding that's not too tight wrapped around and really strained on those stitches. So if we can have a nice even binding that the, the batting fits in nicely, we call it a full binding that's neatly stitched and it's not stitched in a way that the stitches are loose or prolonged. You want nice, tight, quick stitches all the way around, then that's kind of ideal. That's what a judge is looking for. I didn't know about the batting being, you know, like having a little bit of a, batting sticking out so that when you did the binding it would fill in that because I looked at the binding on one I only have two finished quilts right now with binding yeah. that I did and both of them have that 
that gap you're talking about because I didn't know that. Yeah, um, and it's it's also important to note that a judge is not necessarily going to be picky about whether it's a hand stitch binding or a I machine was stitch. Talk about that. Yeah, like a machine stitch binding can be totally okay. But think about this: if you have a quilt that is hand pieced, hand quilted, and then you put a machine binding on it, yeah. that might not really fit. But if you have a modern quilt or even a traditional quilt that's all pieced and all machine done, you put a machine binding on it. It just matters whether it's well done and it, you know, it keeps the integrity of the quilt intact. Um, with the binding, besides, you know, making sure the fill is just right, if a person um, attaches each strip, um, either horizontal or using the angle, which does a judge look at that also? So are you talking about putting the long pieces of binding together before you put it on your yes. quilt? Yes. Yeah. So the reason why, you know, generally, a, I can't speak for all judges, but, you know, the reason why you generally want that bias cut and that bias piecing in a binding is so that there's less bulk in the binding. If you have a straight horizontal cut, then that's all on top of itself with all those folds in the binding. So if you do the angled cut, you're just easing up the bulk a little bit. And I think that's a great thing to let newbies know about. Yeah. Yeah. Are there certain criteria for judging bindings on quilt? Yeah. Like I think it really just needs to be well done, you know, well achieved. And if, if it's messy or wobbly or it's not straight or the stitches are loose, we're looking for a binding that's not full. We're looking for corners that are not nice and square, you know, those kind of things. Generally, a judge will look for things in the quilt that are more important and educational. And, you know, if there's a lot going well with the quilt maybe they'll comment on the binding if that's the only problem but um, we really try to comment on the things that are the most important that will help that quilter move forward in their quilting journey so as as a beginner you know i consider myself to be a um maybe a, a intermediate to an advanced beginner one of the things that i hadn't been told or hadn't seen on a how-to video is when you're doing the corners and you, and you have that um, diagonal angle going right there. I saw where someone mentioned that you should sew that down. Now, neither one of mine are sewed. I mean, the whole binding's fastened down, but that little diagonal that goes to the corner, that's not hand sewn. Or is that something else that a judge looks at when they're looking at binding? Yeah, I think a lot of judges do look that and it just goes to the integrity of the binding. If it's loose like that, it might lose its squareness over time. It might catch on things, things like that. If you just stitch it down very neatly, it's secure, you know. I, and again, I, I kind of want to really stress that when a judge is judging a quilt, they're going to be trying to find the things that can really help the quilter the most. And sometimes if you get a comment on the binding, a lot of your other stuff might be really well done and that's all they yeah. can find, <laughs> you know? Are there certain criteria for judging borders on a quilt? And let me kind of expand on that. Um, yeah. I recent, uh, in, I don't know, a few months ago, I saw somebody who um, live sews what she's creating and she made the comment that if she was at a quilt show and she was a judge and she saw a border with a seam in it, she would automatically just say, I'm not going to judge this quilt any further. What is your thoughts on that? Because a lot of us can't afford to, to waste extra fabric to cut the fabric for a border length of fabric, not width of fa fabric. So does that disqualify anybody who happens to do the width of fabric instead of the length of fabric? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say that I don't think I've ever even heard of an incident where a quilt has been disqualified from a show, except in the instances where it doesn't follow the rules of the show. So, you know, if we're talking about borders, for instance, 
if I was judging a quilt and I saw borders that were pieced, the first thing I would do is think, does this look intentional? You know, are the, if it's pieced, are they even on both sides? Um, or is it all long lengths of fabric and then, oops, there's just one piece piece and that's it. And uh oh, did they run out of fabric? So that might be something like, you know, either try to piece the whole thing or try to not piece at all to make it look even all the way around the quilt and intentional. Another thing that's not really necessary is to start doing the bias seams in your border. That looks kind of, um, it looks like you've run out of fabric yeah. and there's no need to make it on the bias because you're not trying to save bulk like in the binding. So it's kind of more ideal to have straight ones. Even if you don't have them matched up, if you had them offset, but they look purposeful, mm -hmm. really that's kind of what we're going for is in the design, does it look like you've done it on purpose or does it look like you've made an oops and you haven't measured things properly or you've run out of fabric? Yeah, I try to make my borders where if I'm going to have to have seams, They'll either be straight across each other or like you mentioned, one up here and one down here on purpose that way. Yeah. The other thing I've noticed that I think is kind of cool that I want to learn how to do is mitered corners for borders. How often do you see those in quilts? Oh, we see those a lot. If there is angles throughout the entire quilt and you have those mitered corners to draw your eye from the edges right in, that can really be appealing in the design of a quilt. Yeah, we see it quite a bit. Um, what category in a quilt show receives lesser entries and why? Hmm. I think when I, I mean, I can only talk from my own experience as a judge. And as you know, I only became a certified judge last September, but I have been judging for about 10 years. And what I found, found at the beginning, when I first started judging, there was very few quilts in the modern categories. The modern categories didn't even start till about I saw them for the first time in 2013, I think. But um, other categories that often have fewer quilts in quilt shows are sometimes the miniatures. Um, yeah, it all really depends on the area and the size of the show. If you have a more traditional guild, sometimes there's less art quilts. And if you have a more artful guild, sometimes there's less traditional quilts and then some guilds are specifically modern quilts so that's all they have in their shows and then you're not seeing any smaller quilts so it kind of depends on the region the size of the show um and also another thing that i've seen less and less of is whole cloth quilts as well what's a whole cloth quilt so a whole cloth quilt is like one giant piece of fabric. And really the feature of the quilt is the quilting. So it's it's just meticulously, beautifully hand or machine quilted the entire thing. And it's just one giant piece of cloth. Oh, okay. Um, my, I have a, a quilt that's over 150 years old. And it I think she made it from feed sack. Oh, but wow. it, you know, it's falling apart now. And there's nothing I can do to stop it. But it's all one big piece and then she hand quilted it and in oh, between wow. the two layers is an old blanket that she put in between it so oh that cool. sounds like that sounds like a real treasure yeah it was my grandmother who made it and my mom had given it to me um where could a newbie enter a quilt with less competition in order to learn more about what judges are looking for in quilts as an educational oh. way of learning yeah, that's a really good question. I would say to start locally with fall fairs, smaller quilt shows, with your guild as well, if you have a quilting guild. And then from there, you can look for bigger shows that don't have a jurying process. Like, for instance, one that comes to mind is the Festival of Quilts in Birmingham in the UK. They have the type of show where if you enter the show, your quilt's in the show. They don't have a jurying process. They do, they do judge the show. Um, but, you know, sometimes there are shows that are regional and they they have areas that are judged and areas that are not judged. So you can check that box sometimes if you want to be judged or not. Um, but when it comes to choosing whether to have your quilt judged, I always recommend to have it judged because you might get some feedback that really helps you grow as a quilter. Yeah. Um, when a person wants to enter a quilt into a show, do they have to belong to a guild in order to participate? I think it's different with every single show. Um, you don't have to belong to a guild to enter like the festival, the International Quilt Festival in Houston. But if you were to enter the Modern Quilt Guild, I believe you have to be a member of a modern guild. You could be an individual member too, but 
Um, there are certain shows that you have to be a member and certain shows that you don't. And also regionally, most quilting guilds put on the show. So it's pretty likely that you'd have to be a member for a regional show. Um, yeah, so I would say just look at the show guidelines for every single show to find out. Okay. When did you start your YouTube channel? What were your goals at the beginning and how has that evolved over time? I wasn't aware of your podcast until you told me. Yeah. So, well, so I've, been, out there. I've been podcasting since 2013 when I took a big break in there, but my podcast has been the thing that has really helped my business grow. But recently I started up my YouTube channel in earnest. So I've had a YouTube channel for ages and I've always just dabbled around putting a few things on here and there, but just a couple months ago, I started putting a show up or, a, you know, a video up every month. And so the kind of things I have on there so far, which is really funny because these are the questions you've been asking. I have a binding video, how to do a binding. I have a pieced binding video if you want to piece a whole bunch of fabrics together to make a binding. So I have a few good tutorials up there so far. And I have some fantastic footage of the IQF in Houston. I interviewed almost every single creator who had a, a special exhibit at Houston mm -hmm. and I also interviewed a whole bunch of influencers and quilters and artists that I just bumped into along the way and next week I'm going to put up a video of all the vendors so you'll see all the latest new products that they had available at Houston this year I'm so happy to hear that I'll be watching that oh um, will you be sharing tips and advice on your YouTube channel for those who are interested in in entering a quilt in a quilt show yeah well i haven't made that video yet but that's a great idea um i have uh, a new lecture actually that i've only just delivered once or twice in practice that is all about judging and um so that's going to be something new if you happen to belong to a quilting guild you can um hire me to do that but yeah when it comes to my YouTube channel, I will be having all kinds of tips and tricks. And if you want to see something that's all about judging that I've already done, I was invited and I flew down to Vegas to be on the So Yeah Brothers YouTube channel. Yeah, that's how I found out about you. <laughs> yeah, and they had me all about judging. It was such a lovely, um, fun segment that we did. We had a lot of fun and it was hilarious. And yeah, those are just some really great guys down there. So I had a lot of fun with that. So you can look that up. So yeah, brothers. And yeah, it's Y-E-A-H. So you can find yep. that on YouTube already. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, who is your quilty inspiration or how do you find inspiration? Well, I can tell you that there have been so many people that I've had on my podcast, but one person that I have followed for probably two decades, and I I was an absolute fan girl the first time I met her in the UK, is Laura Kemshaw. Now, she's kind of a design duo with her mother, Laura and Linda Kemshaw. They have designmatterstv.com. And uh, they have this artful website where they teach you all kinds of artful quilting and all kinds of like sketchbooks and all kinds of things on there. But I have always followed and loved her. And every time she does something new, I will go and try the techniques and have some fun. And she's always been such an inspiration to me. Oh, that's really cool. Okay, now we're going to have fun here. <laughs> so my first rapid fire is okay. share five tips for beginner quilters that you think would help them become better quilt makers okay five tips so the first tip is buy what you can afford so buy the best that you can afford so if you have the opportunity to buy good quality fabric buy it um number two is don't go haywire on buying the rulers. Buy some rulers that are really effective. Buy two or three good quality ones. Try to use them for everything. And as you explore what you love, then expand your ruler collection. Tip number three, really dive into how to care for your sewing machine. Read the manual, understand how to change the bobbins and clean everything so that your sewing machine is always there for you. What number am I on? Number four? <laughs> yeah, you're about to start number four. Number four, I would say use the stitches on your machine. 
explore the stitches and really enjoy the capabilities of your machine. There's so many stitches on there that are just beautiful. And I, I suggest that you try them before you get onto your quilt, try them elsewhere and then put them on your quilt, but explore the stitches. And number five, number five I would say is do the work. So what I mean by that is so many people who you know, take my classes or anyone's classes nowadays, they have this feeling inside that they should just be an expert immediately at everything that they try. Yeah. <laughs> and what I suggest is you try and you fail and you play and you try and you fail and you play and you just keep, it's all about learning and you just have fun exploring and then you'll discover what you love and then you can really go in that direction. So yeah, it's kind of like when you're, a, when you're a gardener and you're, when, you know, I've been gardening since I was 11. And so I'm, I consider myself to be a master gardener, but if I had to skip through part of it, I couldn't say that, you know, yeah. you fall down, you kill things and you learn from that. And that's what I'm trying to teach my daughter right now. She's finally, one of them is showing interest and she's learning how to grow Hoyas. She says, mom, this one died. I said, did you write what you were doing the whole? No. I said, so you need to have a journal and you write that journey. So when you do kill something, you can go back and read it and say, oh, this is what I did wrong. You know, it's a good learning way of learning it. Same thing with sewing, I would think. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's so important to take a lot of classes because, I mean, you can learn everything online. If you can't afford to go to all the classes, that's okay. There's a million bajillion things on YouTube to learn. But do that work, like really take all that learning. There's there's people who have been quilting for 20 years and they've never taken a beginner, fundamental, you know, precision piecing and quilting course and it's not too late to go back and do that you I did that probably 12 years into my quilting journey I went back and took a very very beginner course I'd never used a pin in my life and I learned so much in that class I use those skills to this day oh cool okay here's the next rapid fire share five notions that you think all beginner quilt makers should have on hand ah Okay, well, of course you need, I'll, I'll call this one notion, you need a rotary cutter mat and rulers. So we'll call that one thing. That purple thing is one of my favorite tools. It's a little mm -hmm. tool where you can pull ribbons, you can use it as a stylus, all kinds of things like that. Um, I love snag magic. Snag magic is a needle with a loop on it. And I'll just say, I actually sell it on my website, but I'm not sure how much it would cost to send to Greenland, but snag magic is something that you use when you've quilted your quilt and you've left strings, instead of back stitching and creating big knots on your quilt, you leave your strings and tie them off. The snag magic helps you tie and pull that into your quilt. Um, and number four, I would say is a really good pair of snippers. You can get all kinds of plastic and sort of low quality snippers and stuff like that. But I think you should get a nice, heavy, really good quality pair of snippers. I love LDH scissors. Um, they're in Canada, but LDH is, you can go to their website. Um, number five, what else would be another tool? I would say my phone because I love to take photos of things all over the world that inspire me. I'm always posting on Instagram, bathroom walls and carpets in hotels and all kinds of creative things. So my phone would be the last tool. And I love to take lots of photos and put them in a file for inspiration that I can go back to again and again. Great idea. Share. Okay. The next rapid fire is share top five tips for entering quilts in a quilt show for the first time. Okay, if this is your very first time, first of all, the first tip is enter your very best work, okay? Don't worry about entering 10 quilts of everything you've ever made. Pick your very best one that you think you've most well achieved and enter that one quilt. Number two is take very good photography. You're not going to get past the jurying process if you have crummy photos with crummy lighting or they're crooked or they don't have the whole quilt. Number three is read the entire directions, the rules, everything about that quilt show, the rules, regulations, everything. Make sure you really understand um, what you're getting into and what you have to do to register. Um, like for instance, you have to take, a, sometimes you have to take a picture of the whole quilt with all the edges showing. And then you also have to submit a detail shot. 
And if you forget to submit that extra shot, you're out. You don't even make it past the jurying process, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So that's three. Um, number four, I would say really read through and understand the categories. So you make sure your quilt is in the right category. Okay. And then number four, I would say make sure you're, Am I on number four? No, you're going <laughs> on number five. <laughs> okay, number five. Okay, this is my last one. Then I would say volunteer for the show. Volunteer the for the show. I've heard that one. Volunteer for the show because, first of all, shows are so well run by volunteers and they appreciate their volunteers and they can never get enough volunteers as a volunteer you get a behind the scenes look you sometimes get to wear gloves and look at the back of quilts you get to be there early before the show's open you know you can sometimes you can volunteer and be in the judging room and you can learn so much there mm -hmm. so i really recommend that you be a judge i mean you be a volunteer in the judging room or anywhere in the show so that you really get to learn a lot about behind the scenes Okay, that's really a great, you know, a lot of good information there. So you have, so do you have any other advice to quilters that you want to share with us? I think the most important thing that I want to put out to the world is that you have your own story. Like I love to share stories on the podcast, right? So sometimes I have really big famous people on the podcast and it's so fun to do that, but some of the best podcasts I've ever put out there are a mom who made it a quilt of coated coat of many colors for her daughter. And she's a military mom or something like that. Sometimes those are the best stories. So think about your story. Like, are you creating things because you just want to follow the patterns or, you know, you want to do what everyone else is doing? Are you doing what you really love? Are you listening to people who are like, those colors are weird or why are you doing that? Or are you just doing what you want? So I would say, you know, my final little piece of advice is explore, 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 find what you love in quilting and just do that, whether anybody else likes it or not. Yeah. Um. I tend to take, <laughs> sometimes I take a pattern and I'm making something and it'll have negative space and I can't really explain it, but I have to put something in the <laughs> negative space. So I do. Yeah. But yeah, I think you should do what makes you feel good, not what somebody thinks you should do. Yeah. And okay. I mean, it's go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. I was going to say, and you know, it's okay if you are a quilter who absolutely loves to make patterns. It's okay if you're a quilter who has never made a pattern and you only do your own thing. It's okay if you're an improv quilter, a modern quilter, or an art quilter. Mm -hmm. Just do what you love because if you follow your own path, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be your own story. Okay, so I have two more questions and then, uh, yeah, I think we'll be done. Um, one of them is has to do with the quilting process itself. What processes of quilting should a beginner start out learning? Oh, that's a great question. Because I had so, talked about quilting itself. Yeah. So, I mean, there's hand quilting and machine quilting, of course, right? And it depends what kind of machine you have, if you have domestic or long arm. But if you are a new quilter, it's pretty likely that you have a domestic mm -hmm. sewing machine. So I would say the best way to start off is to do straight line quilting. You know, make sure you understand your tension and do straight line. You can try with a walking foot if you happen to have a walking foot as well um, and do all kinds of geometric straight line quilting to start off with. Start at the middle of your quilt and go out and then you'll feel well achieved if you've made a couple quilts on your own instead of having to send them off to a long armor. And then from there, I would go into ruler quilting and free motion quilting. And when I start helping people get introduced into these kinds of quilting, I really encourage them to practice. So when I started off free motion quilting, I made dozens and dozens and dozens of samples just to try all these different things. Um, I actually, way back then when I was starting, Leah Day was doing her 365 days of free motion and mm -hmm. she has it all free out there still on a blog. And yeah. she has a book because of it and she has a wonderful business that she's flourishing in because of it. But you can still go back to her original videos and watch them and it's such a great journey for learning because you are just literally following along with her and trying every different type of design on samples so that's a great way to learn just it, it all comes back to just doing the work on the free motion quilting 
should a beginner try just warning the motion of motion before they add into the ruler stuff? Yeah, you can do either. Like they're completely two completely different things. Yeah. So, you know, once you've got your straight line quilting down, you can go straight into ruler quilting and that can be a segue into free motion or you can go into free motion and just add ruler. Like you don't have to do one or the other. Ruler quilting I find is is pretty achievable. You you have a ruler, you're quilting around it, you know, it's there's all kinds of wonderful beginner classes you can take. I have a Canadian creator here who creates the rulers herself with her husband in mm -hmm. their shop. And that's called Silly Moon Quilting. And she has so many amazing beginner videos you can learn. And she has a really good beginner workshop as well. So, I mean, that's a really fun thing to try once you've got the straight line quilting down pat. And then sometimes people find it really daunting to do free motion. I'm telling you, you just have to go for it. You just have to do it on samples before you do it on the real thing. And then you'll build up your bravery and you'll go from there. Okay, so my last question is going to be very controversial. Okay. Um, how do I put this question? I have seen where there's been censorship with quilts mm -hmm. in some quilt shows. And... Um, I'm wondering what you think about quilts being censored instead of just be allowing them to be put out there the way they were meant to be put out there. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that a quilt should be put out there if it's been made by a creator and it has a message, right? So, and I encourage people to quilt messages in their quilts. It's part of exploring your journey. And, um, you know, a lot of times it might not be a message that a certain person wants to hear but no. it might be a message that somebody needs to hear, right? right? So I'll give you an example of a really great one. And gosh, I, I might have to send you a note after on who the creator was because I can't okay. remember her name. But the first time I saw a quilt that I didn't think it was controversial at all, but I heard it was controversial when someone walked up to me. It was at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And I walked around the corner and there was this glorious quilt with penises all over it and they were silk 3d oh in their full glory and it was shocking <laughs> it was very very shocking you never thought i'd be talking about this on your show did you but it was very no. shocking to me. Oh. and i thought what on earth like i was really surprised by it so i read the whole thing and i was fascinated to learn that you know this is a story of a feminist talking about how you know, the naked form of women has been used for a millennia over time in mm -hmm. art and no one's yep. ever batted an eye. But as soon as a man's body was used over the history, a fig leaf would be slapped on it, right? <laughs> yep. And so she made this art quilt as a hilarious rendition of that, like a portrayal of, of you know, what she believed in. And so it was really interesting. I was just taking it all in. You know, it was this shocking quilt. It had a good meaning. It was hilarious. I was enjoying, you know, the story. Someone walked around the corner and looked at it and said something along the lines of, oh, that is ridiculous and uh, totally inappropriate. Yeah. And so I said to her, well, wait, though, like, you really need to read this. Like, you should really read what it's all about. So she stopped and read it. And then she said, oh, that makes total sense. It really makes sense. And then her son walked around the corner who was maybe 15 or so. And she said to him, you've got to come see this. And I was like, okay, my job is done. So yep. I think it's, you know, whether it's controversial or not, I think it's really important for quilters to tell their stories through their quilts. So yeah, seen, I'd love to see a little bit of controversy in quilts. Yeah. You know, um, the, I don't remember which quilt show it was, but the, uh, a couple of the quilt creators have been um, posting some of their little visits to a few of the shows, and uh, you'll see a lot of controversial stuff in the modern quilt uh, show. And, uh, you know, some of those, I, I'm like, man, people are really putting it out there, and this is a good thing. Yeah. In our world, they, everybody wants to silence you when you're trying to, you know, say something, so... Yeah, yeah, it's really a, an important thing to move the conversation ahead about inclusivity, all kinds of issues that are out there that have just been ingrained in societies yeah. for so many years. So it's yep. nice to keep that conversation going.
Yep. Do you want to do you want to share anything else? Because I'm out of questions now. <laughs> okay. Well, the only I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, if you're interested in connecting with me, you can find me online anywhere as the quilter on fire. Um, if you have any um, wonderful creators out there that you would recommend for me to have on the podcast, let me know. And um, like I said earlier, I just started up my YouTube channel in earnest and I'm working really hard to build it up. So if you're interested in some of the stuff that you listen to today, please go and check it out and subscribe to the Quilter on Fire on YouTube. Um, what's the name of your podcast? Oh, excuse me for one second. I'm sorry, I'll have to edit this out. There's a big emergency test happening. Uh-oh. Just a test. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I hope you can edit that out. Um, what was the last question? Oh, what's my website? Is that the last question? No, what's your podcast web address? Oh, okay, sure. So if you're interested in listening to the podcast, let me just tell you how to do that in case you've never listened to one before. You can find my website, quilteronfire.com, and you can click on the Listen and Learn tab, and you'll see every podcast I've ever done. I'm approaching booking guests for my 150th episode, and um, so you can find it there. But also, if you've got a, a phone, like a smartphone, you can find it on any podcast app that you love. So I've got okay. some amazing okay, guests cool. coming up. I've got some big milestones coming up with my guests. So I'm really excited about that. That's awesome. Cause I didn't know about you until I saw this uh, little short, short that uh, you did with Soya, yeah, where you were looking at a New York beauty quilt and you were talking about the binding. And I'm like, I didn't know that. <laughs> that's why I wanted to talk to you. Cause I'm like, Hey, somebody who knows all this stuff. And it yeah. there's like me and there's plenty of us out there that want to, you know, that we, you know, it's not always talked about or people don't think to share it when they're, you know, teaching some skill or you just, for whatever reason, you don't ever see it in somebody's video. Yeah, that's so okay. true. So if you're thinking well, of, if you're thinking of listening into the podcast, some of the big guests I have coming up, I mean, they're all big, they're all wonderful, but I have a few really exciting ones. I have a Christmas podcast coming up with Jackie Gearing, and she is the headliner at QuiltCon for 2024. My New Year's podcast on January 2nd is going to be Pat Sloan. She is the voice of quilting. So I'm really excited about having Pat Sloan. And, you know, if you've been in the fabric design world for the last few decades, my 150th episode coming up is going to be Amy Butler. She is one of I the most iconic. She's one of the most iconic designers in the fabric world. And uh, she does these incredible quilt travel retreat destinations to right. places like Bali and things like that. So those are some of the fun guests one. I have. <laughs> yeah. Those are some of the fun guests I have coming up. Okay. Well, are you going to be at QuiltCon? I will be, yes. So if you're interested in meeting me in person at QuiltCon, I will be in the Oliso booth. So that's Oliso Irons, and I'll have my podcast lounge. So you could come up and say hello, and you could actually be on the podcast. And podcast, okay. Yeah, because I'm going to go. It's kind of funny. Um, Yeah, let's stop this, okay? <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you for coming to this interview. I have been very excited about uh sharing this particular po uh, recording because I knew that she was a judge, and I think that a lot of us, got to hear a lot of things that we hadn't heard so hopefully a lot of you who have watched this have learned something new and like she said if you want to contact her do that because she knows all of this stuff so thank you for coming for my interview I really appreciate it oh thank you so much for having me Katie it's been a pleasure yes bye everybody